Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not no major, you know, it's like some catastrophe or something. Uh, it's well within historical range and not even noticeable particularly. Uh, furthermore, there's also evidence about the effect of running deficits. Uh, there have been a couple of times, I think about half a dozen times in American history when there has been an attempt to balance the budget. And in fact, every single one of them has led pretty quickly to either recession or deep depression. Uh, on the other hand, there, here it gets tricky, but there are some studies, the only studies that have been done, as far as I know, most of them done by an economist named Robert Eisner at uh, Northwestern, uh, where, which have been attempts to estimate, to try to work out the effect of a deficit on things like investment, growth, uh, uh, you know, anything you can measure. It turns out there's a not huge, but somewhat positive effect to running deficits. And the reason is not very surprising. After all, every business runs deficits all the time. Every business is in debt. Every household is in debt. Uh, everything that functions is in debt all the time. Uh, you're in debt because you're trying to, you know, to do something. Now, of course, if you use the debt is neither good nor bad. I mean, if you use the debt to, you know, gamble at Las Vegas, it was a bad debt. If you use the debt to, uh, you know, to send your kids to college or, uh, you know, buy a car or start a business or something, then it can be a good debt, okay, from the point of view of economic gain and uh, other things. Uh, it depends what you do with it. And if the, if the borrowing is used intelligent, for example, if, bar if government borrowing goes into building infrastructure and improving education and uh, health and so on, so there's a more viable society down the road, uh, there'll also be more growth, more income, you pay off the debt. Uh, that's what matters. Uh, what matters is wise investment in people's lives and the way they live and what's produced and so on and so forth. And of course, wise investment is going to, is going to involve debt. Uh, public spending is in fact a major way in which the any economy grows, in a, sometimes in a healthy way, sometimes in a destructive way, it depends what you do with it. So as far as we know, at least, there's nothing, there's no big imperative about cutting the debt. I mean, obviously, it, it depends, despite the Reagan years, which did, you know, I mean, they did turn the United States very quickly from the world's biggest creditor into the world's biggest debtor very fast. Uh, but that was because of a combination of massive uh, spending, the massive state spending and uh, 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 tremendous borrow. There, there was kind of like a borrow and spend abandon in the Reagan years. Uh, and mainly, as David Stockman said right at the beginning, the, there's no secret, the uh, head of the budget, because if they figured if they get deep enough into debt, they'll be a straitjacket and they'll be able to kill social spending. Well, okay, if that's your goal, then that's a good thing. And if you can use uh, cutting the debt to achieve that goal, then that's fine. Uh, but for the general population, that doesn't make any sense at all. And even on narrow economic grounds, it's very dubious that it makes any sense. Probably harmful on narrow econo on the narrowest economic grounds. Now, different. You know, in Canada, the answer to that may be different. Remember, the, the, take, take the talk about how the debt is a burden on future generations. Well, in the United States, that's simply not true. The debt is mostly owned by Americans, uh, which means that the payments on the debt stay right in the country. Now, it may have a redistributive effect, like it's probably the case, although even this is pretty hard to show because of pension funds and everything else. Uh, but it's, you know, you'd guess that it's the case that richer people hold more of the debt than poorer people, proportional income. But if that's true, then the debt will indeed have a redistributive effect, in fact, a regressive redistributive effect, although even that's challenged. But, if it, but, uh, but that you take care of enough by other means, like, say, more progressive taxation. So those are not big social problems. I mean, there's, there's nothing unworkable about the social problems. Uh, the debt it does, the, the payment on the debt just stays, almost all stays inside the country, just gets reshuffled around and reshuffled around in complicated ways. Uh, so there's, there's no burden on future generations. I mean, the burden on future generations is if you don't leave them with a viable society. Like if your children and your grandchildren are going to go into society with, which doesn't have roads and bridges and people aren't educated and people are dying of uh, diseases and so on and so forth, yeah, then 
there isn't going to, there's not, it's not going to be a nice life for them, and in fact they won't be able to uh, maintain anything like the lifestyle they have, people have now. But uh, uh, f f in order to achieve those goals, to create a viable society, public spending is uh, absolutely a necessity. Furthermore, the business community knows it. That's why they insist on the Pentagon staying high, because that's the form of public spending they like. Uh, and they don't call it public spending, but that's a method whereby the general public pays the costs of research and development and so on, and basically, it, you know, creates the creates the high tech system, which is then handed over, and not just uh, engineering and so on. Same is true of biotechnology and everything else. Hard to find a dynamic sector of the economy where that hasn't been a major factor. Uh, so yeah, there, there is that kind of public spending. But what about the other kind? I mean, what about you know creating, helping, helping develop a society in which a human being would want to live, uh, would want to live and would want to work and would want to work productively and so on and so forth. Well, that's uh, public responsibility. Now, how that in you know I, I don't I don't. I think it's not a great idea to have that public responsibility fulfilled through a powerful central government. In fact, I think it's a rotten idea. But under current circumstances, it happens to be the only alternative to having private tyrannies run everything, which is far worse. So given the options, that's the best one, I think. But uh, that means, and I think most people kind of sense this, uh, and that's or at least at some level sense it, which is why you don't have support for uh, balancing the budget. And to get back to your original question, it's why as soon as candidates have to face the public, they drop it like a hot potato. Uh, so it's only uh, the business world and its various flax uh, who say that we have to balance the budget. Not many other people do. I work for a union that uh, represents a lot of people in uh, Canadian newspapers and radio and television. One of the things we see occurring is a, a fragmentation, particularly of the advertising market, but also of the circulation uh, and, and the viewers of, uh, of, the, of this media. And um, I wonder if you agree with that and what implications it has for that idea of having agenda-setting media, you know, necessary to have mass media that are important media that are agenda-setting. And the other, does fragmentation offer us opportunities in terms of alternative media and being able to... Uh, to get a message out, how do you how do you? Well, I, I don't know the details about Canada, though I can't imagine it's very different from the United States and other countries. And the main tendency is towards mega mergers. Uh, so the the number of separate I hate to say independent because they're all more or less the same anyway, but the number of separate news sources is decline has been declining for a long time, uh, and it's declining even more now. Like when you start getting you know, Disney, ABC, or whatever it is. Uh, all of these things are turning into real mega-mergers, and this is just part of what's going on in the business world altogether. Uh, there's a big move towards kind of mega-corporations. There's a big merger frenzy now. It's partly because there's so much financial capital floating around. It's, pro it's pretty destructive for the economy, but that's the way things are going. Uh, and it's pretty strikingly true in the media as well, uh, even internationally. Uh, so like I just came back from India a couple of weeks ago, and the big talk question there is whether the media, which are pretty right-wing by and large, uh, should they resist takeovers by Murdoch and guys like that, uh, which will what will happen if they do what's called liberalizing the economy. Liberalizing the economy means letting the guys with really big money do everything and kick everybody else out because that's the way markets work. Uh, so when uh, should they sort of give away the uh, Indian media to Murdoch and, you know, Conrad Black and these other characters, uh, and the big empires that they run, like ultimately major corporations like, you know, Disney and uh, Warner and so on. Uh, now, one, another part of that is cutting back on news. So it's perfectly true that uh, news is being, uh, uh, news coverage is being cut back. News offices are being cut back. There is less coverage, but that's kind of like uh, you know, it's like the reason I'm late today, uh, as the which didn't have anything to do with the weather. It had to do, I think, ultimately had to do with deregulation of the airlines. Did you go back far enough? One effect of deregulation of the airlines has been to transfer costs to the public. In fact, a lot of automation has that character. Automation, you know, they tell you it's saving money. It's certainly saving money for businesses. 
but if you think about it, it's transferring the costs, and you know it very well. 